We described the influenza life cycle and the mechanism of action of endonuclease and neuraminidase inhibitors. Now let's distinguish between influenza, rhinosinusitis, pharyngitis, and other acute respiratory illnesses using patient-specific factors, clinical manifestations, and diagnostic testing. Rhinosinusitis is inflammation of the paranasal sinuses. In acute sinusitis, the symptoms last less than four weeks, whereas in chronic sinusitis, the symptoms are beyond three months. And in between that, you have subacute rhinosinusitis. Now, if you have rhinosinusitis due to bacteria, we call that acute bacterial rhinosinusitis. And of course, if it's due to viruses, we call it acute viral rhinosinusitis. And then we have acute pharyngitis, which is primarily sore throat that usually lasts one week. There's also acute bronchitis, which is the productive or non-productive cough that lasts up to six weeks. There's the common cold, which is a mild upper respiratory viral illness that usually comes with uh, sneezing and rhinorrhea. And of course, we have allergic rhinitis, which is a non-infectious uh, immunoglobulin immediated reaction against inhaled allergens. The symptoms of acute rhinosinitis include nasal congestion and purulent uh, nasal discharge. And if you keep in mind the anatomy of the sinuses, um, you'll see that these patients can also have maxillary tooth pain, facial pain, or pressure. And of course, these patients can also have fever, fatigue, cough, hyposmia, or anosmia which is basically uh, reduced about, uh, ability to smell or the lack of ability to smell. Uh, they, they can also have ear pressure or fullness, headache, and um, halitosis. Symptoms usually um, last between a day up to 33 days, depending on what's the underlying cause. And what's important to note is that 85% of patients actually can have uh, at least reduction or sometimes uh, even resolution of symptoms within 7 to 15 days, especially if these are uh, viral, um, viral infections, and that's without antibiotic therapy. So, so in studies where uh, the groups were um, receiving placebo, they actually had a high percentage of patients actually have resolution of symptoms. Now, when it comes to acute pharyngitis, there's a triad of sore throat, fever, and pharyngeal inflammation that are the hallmark of acute pharyngitis. And this sore throat is worse with uh, swallowing. The pharyngeal inflammation is characterized by erythema and edema, and it usually lasts for one week. For the, from the IDSA guidelines for rhinosinusitis, uh, for diagnosis of rhinosinusitis, they have major symptoms and they have minor symptoms and their um, criteria is that uh, a patient must have uh, at least two major criteria uh, in order to be diagnosed or they can have one major plus uh, two or more minor symptoms in order to have a diagnosis of rhinosinusitis. Now gram stain and culture uh, from the sinus puncture is not routinely done because uh, it's invasive, time-consuming, and uh, perhaps uh, painful for the patients. Now, it's important if you use this uh, criteria to diagnose the patient, uh, it doesn't really distinguish between whether it's bacterial or viral infection, so that also needs to be determined. So here are the criteria that IDSA has set to uh, distinguish between bacterial and viral. So if the patient meets any of these three criteria, uh, there's a good, sus um, you know, you can um, suspect bacterial uh, rhinosinusitis. So one is if the patient has persistent symptoms or signs compatible with acute rhinosinusitis uh, for at least 10 days. And that's because viral infections typically result by day 10, whereas bacterial infections typically persist uh, through um, 10 days. Now, before the 10 days, if the patient has severe symptoms or sign of, uh, signs of high fever, so 39 degrees uh, centigrade or higher, and purulent uh, nasal discharge or facial pain lasting for at least three to four, four consecutive days, that's suggestive of bacterial uh, in, uh, infection. As well as if the patient has the double sickening. So if the patient um, was initially improving and then followed by uh, worsening, 
uh, that's referred to as double sickening or double worsening and basically the first part of it was due to viruses and the second part is due to bacterial uh, growth so that's also suggestive of bacterial rhinosinusitis now in patients with acute pharyngitis only a small portion of patients actually have the infection due to streptococcus pyogenes. In fact, in adults, only 5 to 15% of these infections are due to streptococcus pyogenes. And the reason we are talking about streptococcus pyogenes is that this organism specifically can lead to some serious complication. In general, we break the complications into suppurative and non-suppurative uh, uh, complications. So basically the suppurative complications in, involve uh, pus discharge. So these are things like abscess, uh, mastoiditis. Uh, but what I want to bring your attention to is the non-suppurative um, complications, which include glomerulonephritis. So in the kidneys but as well as acute rheumatic fever and what's significant about acute rheumatic fever is that someone with acute rheumatic fever can actually have a resolution but if it doesn't resolve on its own it can actually lead uh, chronically to rheumatic heart disease and what's significant about rheumatic heart disease is that it can actually lead to heart failure atrial fibrillation and stroke and also death so this is why uh, we emphasize treatment of streptococcus pyogenes uh, pharyngitis. Now here are the IDSA um, criteria for distinguishing between group A streptococcal pharyngitis and viral pharyngitis. So the most important is, uh, you know, absence of fever suggests that it's a viral pharyngitis, whereas if you do have fever uh, as part of the um, triad, uh, it's more suggestive of group A streptococcal pharyngitis. Now, if you use these criteria, uh, you know, it's more suggestive. It doesn't really confirm. So if someone has fever, uh, it still needs to be confirmed uh, by bacteriologic um, uh, culture. So what they do is that you actually uh, swab the throat or, or the clinician will uh, do a, a swab of the throat and do a rapid antigen test for, for group A streptococcus. So if this test uh, positive then the patient will be diagnosed with group A strep pharyngitis and now where it, if it turns out to be negative there's no need for confirmation in adults because um, because there's a low incidence of uh, group A strep pharyngitis in adults now in children um, you know it is recommended to confirm it if it's negative now because strep pharyngitis is contagious uh, you might think that, uh, you know, if somebody gets it, you should test uh, all of the household members, but that's actually not recommended. Now let's take a look at clinical manifestations of influenza. Patients with uncomplicated influenza typically have fever, chills, headache, myalgia, malaise, and anorexia, which are very nonspecific. Now, in order to distinguish influenza from pneumonia, it's important to note that people with influenza have dry cough, so there is no speedum production. And some individuals can even uh, be asymptomatic. And in uncomplicated influenza, symptoms typically last four to five uh, days. Influenza can also be complicated, and there are, generally speaking, uh, four categories of complications. The first complication is primary influenza viral pneumonia. Now, while uncomplicated influenza is typically an, an upper respiratory tract infection, when the virus makes it to lower respiratory tract, it will cause primary influenza viral pneumonia. And because this is pneumonia due, due to influenza virus, it's a virus. So when the, uh, you know, when we get a chest x-ray on the patient, there are actually no consolidation. So when you see no consolidation, that means that it's unlikely to be due to bacteria. So it's very likely to be a viral infection. Now, because it is viral pneumonia, because of the pneumonia part, now the patients are going to have more hypoxia. So there is problem with oxygenation. And of course, if we get the speedome sample and we do gram stain, there will be no significant bacteria seen. And no bacteria will be grown on speedome cu uh, culture unless uh, normal flora. Now, one thing that will diagnose viral pneumonia for sure, if on the speedome sample, if we do a reverse transcription uh, PCR, uh, if the PCR is positive, that actually confirms uh, viral pneumonia, viral influenza pneumonia. Now, these patients, of course, will not respond to antibiotics because it's a viral infection. 
However, because it's pneumonia, uh, mortality is high. Another complication that can happen is secondary bacterial pneumonia. So once the patient get the uh, viral influenza, uh, it will be followed by a period of improvement lasting 4 to 14 days, followed by uh, recrudescence of fever associated with signs and symptoms of bacterial pneumonia. So basically during the first phase, the virus will be cleared. However, in the meantime, bacterial infection will be incubating. So while the bacteria are growing, the patient will be improving and then once enough bacteria have grown that's when the patient starts to deteriorate again and then followed by symptoms and the reason uh, and the way we will uh, actually diagnose a secondary bacterial pneumonia and the reason we call it secondary is because this is secondary due to the actual primary infection which was influenza so influenza is the primary infection and then the bacteria will be secondary to the influenza so this time, because bacteria are involved, on the chest x-ray, you will see consolidation. And of course, it's pneumonia, so you will have marked hypoxia. And this time, on sputum culture, you will start to uh, see growth of bacteria. Now, of course, not every patient will grow bacteria on the, on the culture, but if you do see bacteria growing, that confirms bacterial pneumonia. Now, with infection control in the hospitals, Influenza outbreak is not very common in the hospitals, so by far majority of influenza uh, causing secondary bacterial pneumonia is from the community. So for the most part, these are community acquired pneumonia. But one thing that's special about influenza causing pneumonia is that the common pathogens are Streptococcus pneumoniae uh, as well as Staphylococcus aureus. So because Staphylococcus aureus is one of the top two uh, organisms uh, causing uh, secondary bacterial pneumonia, then the question is, uh, should you cover for MRSA or MSSA coverage empirically is enough? So community acquired pneumonia guidelines basically have uh, risk uh, factors for identifying those at risk for MRSA, which also apply to this. Um, for critically ill patients, however, empiric MRSA coverage is recommended by uh, the influenza guidelines. Now, here's a list of risk factors uh, for, uh, for actually having complicated influenza, which I let you read. This is according uh, to, this, uh, to the CDC.